A new development today, the last defendant in the Holly Bobo murder case gets to walk away from prison. Falsely accused, everybody. Innocent man. Holly Bobo began her day early on April 13, 2011. She had an important exam and was studying in her room. Later, her family left the house to go to work. After they had left, a neighbor heard a scream coming from her house. Unfortunately, a tragedy was unfolding there. In our first case today, we will discuss the disappearance of the young girl and the investigation that spanned over three years. We will also witness a family massacre in Australia and the capture of the perpetrator. Brace yourselves, we're stepping into the crime scene now. Holly Bobo was born on October 12, 1990 in the USA. She went to the University of Tennessee and wanted to be a nurse. Holly's mother was Karen, her father was Dana, and her brother was Clint. They were a happy family. On April 13, 2011, Holly woke up early to prepare for her nursing exam, just like her parents who were also getting ready for work. Dana left at 5.30 a.m. and Karen at 7 all a.m. Meanwhile, Holly was studying in her room. At 7.40 a.m., a neighbor on his way to work heard screams from the Bobo's house. He immediately returned to get his phone, then called Karen's workplace to speak with the secretary. He informed her about the screams and requested that she notify Karen right away. It was around 7.45 a.m., and Holly should have already been at school. A while later, the family dog began barking, and Clint peered outside. He saw Holly's car parked outside the house, which was odd since she usually drove to school. Upon taking a second look, Clint noticed Holly kneeling and appearing to be in conversation with a man. The man, wearing camouflage clothes, was talking seriously with Holly. Clint thought the man was Holly's boyfriend, Drew. Clint didn't hear their conversation well, but he heard Holly ask, why are you doing this? After being told about the screams, the school secretary quickly informed Karen, who immediately called Clint. Clint mentioned that Holly was talking with Drew, but Karen, sensing something was off, clarified that the man was not Drew. Clint saw Holly walking with a man he didn't recognize towards the woods and quickly told his mother. Karen panicked and told Clint to get the gun and call the police. Then she herself urgently called them, saying, My daughter has been abducted. Please respond immediately. Clint took a gun and went outside. He found stains of blood near Holly's car in the garage. The neighbor who heard the scream and Clint called the police together. They looked for Holly in the woods but did not find any evidence of her. Karen and additional police officers arrived at the house simultaneously and she was briefed on the situation. A press conference was held to provide information about the incident. The police stated that there were no drag marks in the woods and therefore assumed Holly had been abducted. Additionally, it was stated that the perpetrator was armed and Holly was afraid. The police, along with Holly's family and volunteers, searched the forest but found nothing. Four days later, Holly's purse was found near a road. A few days later, a farmer found a note containing Holly's information. Holly's phone and SIM card were found at separate locations. As Holly's belongings gradually turned up, Holly herself remained missing. The police reported that they were unable to make any significant progress in the investigation. They questioned drug addicts, sex offenders, and potential suspects, but found no leads. The case saw no progress until January 2014, when Dylan Adams was arrested three years after Holly disappeared. 
But this arrest wasn't connected to Holly's disappearance. Instead, it was due to a weapons charge. One day, Dylan spoke with a retired police officer, claiming he had important information about Holly. As per Dylan's account, Holly was sitting in a chair at Zach Adams' house, Dylan's brother. Dylan went on to say that Zach had both attacked and recorded Holly's sexual assault. Jason Autry was also in the house. Dylan later claimed that he had been coerced into giving the information. In 2014, Zach Adams was charged and arrested for kidnapping and murdering Holly. Dylan Adams was arrested for tampering with evidence. In September of that year, Ernest Stone made a grisly discovery while walking in the woods, Holly's skull. Forensic teams were sent to the site and discovered more of Holly's belongings. Further search efforts uncovered additional human remains, including jawbones, teeth, and ribs. The autopsy findings showed that Holly had been fatally shot from behind in the head with a 32 caliber weapon. As the trial commenced, Zach denied all the accusations against him. Nevertheless, the prosecution contended that Zach had taken Holly, drugged her, sexually assaulted her, and ultimately murdered her, despite Zach's protests of being innocent. Initial testimony was provided by Karen, Holly's mourning mother. Overcome with emotion, she informed the judge, I can't breathe and need medical assistance. Afterward, she divulged that she was familiar with Zach. She resided in the same community and had even acted as his tutor during his fourth grade year. Another witness, Jason Autry, said he wasn't involved. He explained that on the morning Holly went missing, he called Zach for morphine pills. Zach agreed to give him the pills but asked him to come to Shane Austin's house. Shane was Jason's cousin. When Jason arrived, Zach bluntly said they had a body to dispose of and sought Jason's help. In the back of his truck, he saw a body under a blanket and asked about it. Jason first thought it was a murder related to drugs. Zach then revealed that the body was Holly Bobo's, after which Jason reluctantly agreed to help dispose of it. They planned to dump her into the river and went to a bridge over the Tennessee River, but they hesitated. Concerned that Holly's body would not sink, they coldly considered gutting it to ensure that it would be consumed by wildlife. To their shock as they moved the body, Jason realized Holly was still alive and urgently indicated this to Zach. They ensured no one was nearby. Then, Zach took out his weapon and shot Holly in the back of the head. Fearing the shot had been heard, they quickly placed Holly's body back in the van and departed. The autopsy revealed a bullet wound that entered the back right side of Holly's skull and exited through the lower front. Holly had been killed, likely with a 32 caliber gun. The defense maintained Zach's innocence and accused the police of conducting a hasty investigation. During the trial, Clint presented a description of a man in camouflage seen from his window that did not match Zach Adams's appearance. Additionally, Zach's phone records showed he was not at home during Holly's kidnapping but elsewhere. The defense pointed out Terry Britt as the responsible man for the murder. He was previously convicted of sexual crimes and lived near Holly. The police questioned him, but his statements were not reliable. It is alleged that he spied on the house before the murder. However, the jury was not convinced by the arguments for his innocence and found Zach guilty on all charges. As a result of being charged with kidnapping and rape, he was sentenced to life in prison without the chance of parole. As part of the plea deal, Dylan Adams admitted to first-degree murder and involvement in the kidnapping. He was sentenced to 50 years in prison. Jason Autry confessed to facilitating the murder 
and participating in the kidnapping, receiving an eight-year sentence for each crime totaling 16 years. Despite facing potential charges, Shane Austin was never brought to trial and later committed suicide. Austin's lawyer stated that prior to his passing, he had cooperated with the police and consistently affirmed his innocence. Teodora Gonzalez, known as Teddy, was born in 1954 in Baguio, Philippines. He was one of four kids in his family. Education was important to him and he worked hard. He eventually studied law and started practicing it in 1979. At 23, he fell in love with Mary Clara Datis, who was 18 at the time. It was love at first sight. The couple got married in 1980 and soon after their wedding, they had their first child, Seth Gonzalez. Three years later, their daughter Claudine was born and the family now had four members. Teddy was prosperous in his career and worked tirelessly. Like all parents, they wanted to give their children a happy and secure life. Together, Teddy and his wife, Mary went into the real estate industry and opened a pharmacy. In Baguio, they constructed and ran a hotel called Queen Victoria with four floors. The family settled in, but their stay was short-lived. In July 1990, the hotel collapsed after a magnitude 7.7 .7 earthquake hit Luzon. Although the family was saved, Seth was trapped under the rubble. Teddy demonstrated exceptional courage and risked his own life to rescue Seth. After the tragedy, the Gonzalez family relocated to Australia. Teddy pursued his law studies and eventually launched his own law firm specializing in immigration law. The firm prospered, with Mary serving as his secretary. Seth, their son, also studied law and worked part-time at the firm. On July 10, 2001, Seth Gonzalez placed a disturbing call to the Australian police. Seth returned home after being away for a night, only to find some strange things happening. A message on the wall read, Get out Asians! But this was only the beginning. In the hallway, Seth found his father, Teddy Gonzalez, with multiple stab wounds. Later, he discovered the motionless body of his mother, Mary Gonzalez, in the living room. Going upstairs to his sister Claudine's room, he found her throat had been slit. There was chaos in the home, and discriminatory graffiti was discovered on the walls. This horrific incident shook a locality that was recognized for its minimal criminal activities. The primary suspicion was that the killings were the result of a racial assault. Since individuals from different ethnicities lived nearby, inhabitants became anxious and dreaded future assaults. The detectives started investigating the writings on the wall to identify the culprit, even though they suspected these inscriptions could be a diversion. They also attempted to establish the order of the killings. It appeared that the assailant first attacked Claudine, then waited for Mary to return before finally assaulting Teddy. Following the crime, Seth issued a statement to the media. I lost three important people. My dad, who was my hero and role model, my mom, who was the heart of our family, and my sister, who was vibrant. Despite these overwhelming tragedies, I will persevere. Someday, I will start my own family and pass on my father's name to my son. The police stated that they would continue to investigate and had not eliminated any suspects, including Seth. A friend of Seth claimed that they were together at the time of the murders. They ate dinner at a restaurant at 8 cal p.m. and went to an arcade. Seth appeared very sad at his family's funeral. Yet, even after a year of investigation, no one had been charged with the crime. Investigators named Seth as the prime suspect in the Gonzalez family murders after noticing his strange actions. Seth publicly expressed his outrage over the allegations linking him to the murders. 
Amidst the investigation, authorities froze the family's assets, blocking Seth's access to his inheritance. Shortly after his statement, he reported an unusual kidnapping attempt against him. In June 2002, Seth reported an attack to the police, who subsequently found him on the road with minor facial injuries. Seth claimed that although he was subdued and a bag was placed over his head, he managed to escape after being dragged into a car. Two weeks later, the police apprehended Seth Gonzalez and charged him with killing his family. Investigators found that Seth had previously submitted false university documents, a fact his family had discovered. The prosecution alleged he had two primary reasons for committing the murders, including an inheritance exceeding $10 million. On the day of the murders, Seth left the law firm, returned to his home, and first killed his sister. Then he waited downstairs for his mother to return and stabbed her once she arrived in the living room. After he killed his mother, he waited for his father and fatally stabbed him multiple times with a knife. The autopsies revealed defensive wounds on the victim's arms, showing they fought back fiercely. Furthermore, it was discovered that Seth had failed at university and his sister had informed their parents. They threatened to take away his car if he did not improve his grades. Investigations also revealed that Seth had a history of compulsive lying, misleading not just his family but nearly everyone around him. He pretended to be a successful entrepreneur, model, and singer, even creating a fake fan page to embellish his life. The investigators discovered that Seth had falsely claimed his abduction and even uncovered that he emailed death threats to himself. In the course of their investigation before the murder trial, it was uncovered that Seth had made a prior attempt to poison his family. Seth's mother, Mary, had been hospitalized with food, poisoning just one week before the murders. The trial for the Gonzalez family murder started in May 2004. Details of the poisoning attempt were also discussed during the trial. Seth's online searches for poisons led him to purchase toxic seeds that he used in an attempt to poison his mother. Luckily, she survived the attack. However, tragically, she, her husband, and their daughter all died a week later. During the trial, both the prosecution and the defense intensely debated Seth's alibis. He claimed to have been with a friend and further alleged he had spent time with a prostitute who, when questioned by the police, denied his claims. The prosecutors claimed that Seth killed his family to get their $10 million inheritance. Three months after the murders, Seth purchased a car worth $175,000, making an initial payment of $5,000 and promising the seller he'd pay the remainder with his expected inheritance. However, under suspicion for the murders and with the family's assets frozen by investigators, Seth was unable to pay the balance. In the aftermath of the tragedy, Seth quickly sold various family possessions. He sold his mother's car for $45,000 and his father's car for $23,000. After extensive deliberations, the jury found Seth Gonzalez guilty of murdering his mother, father, and sister. He was given three life sentences without parole. After the trial, his Aunt Emily expressed her sorrow. It's a sad day. We love Seth very much and will always love him.